Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, are there wolves in Kent? If not, what did this to a recently shot roe deer in minutes? <laughs> Is there a werewolf loose? Party on! It's the UK general election. We look at who gives a flying ferret about hunting and shooting. First, it's something we've been trying to film for three years. It's Roy Lupton and his love helmet. Roy loves his birds. And at this time of year, they really, really love him. Using his natural sex appeal, he has to get his breeding female and male peregrines and goshawks revved up for artificial insemination. We have seen and heard Roy in full song before. Last time it was a male goshawk ejaculating on his fist. But the peregrines, they prefer his head. David first spotted this wonderful headgear years ago, but Roy refused to don the love helmet. This week we strike. We catch Roy sleep deprived and incapable of defending himself. I'm just going to run in with uh, one of my peregrine tiersels, so peregrine tiersel is meaning male, um, and we had to make him a bit of a special hat. And I think it's quite insulting actually because I think he's recognised that um, I'm balding over the years. The only hat that he likes is sort of a fleshy toned one. As I say, we should be donning that in a second. Um, and oh, Sorry, oh, go on. No, I'm not putting it on. There you go, David. There, happy. And it's waterproof. You can go out in the rain. There you go. So we'll go out. I shall try and record it on my phone because he does tend to be a little bit shy um, and we don't want David putting him off his stroke, so to speak. Very private, bye bye. We're going to go through the, the copulation process, or we're going to go through the, the ritual, so I'm going to go and chuck to him. He's going to be in the scrape, he's going to entice me to the scrape. I'm going to stand slightly off it and then hopefully he shall go through his copulation um, and donate semen onto the hat. The honeycomb mould holds the semen, which Roy can then use to inseminate his females. We've got, we've got semen there and a little bit of semen there. Not a massive donation, but it's enough to give us an insemination later on with one of the girls. So we'll just draw that up. And there we have it. That's what looking silly and wearing a daft hat's for. And that can be used either fresh or we'll store it in the fridge for a few hours. Later on this evening. Just to show Roy has a way with the girls as well as the boys, here's a very ready peregrine falcon. The breeding is of course just the start. Then come the eggs and the incubators, the monitoring, the care and the feeding. He really is the daddy. Do you want some chocolate cake there? Thank you, Roy. And we understand that fashion designer Vivian Westwood and Roy are in talks. Now, someone else who keeps his fluids in the fridge. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. A 24-year-old hunter from Malta is starting a one-year jail sentence after shooting a kestrel. The crackdown by hunters continues after the close vote in April to allow the spring hunting of turtle doves and quail on the island to continue. The injured bird landed in a schoolyard. Kirsten Mifsud also had his hunting license revoked, his shotgun confiscated and was fined €5,000. In addition, the hunting season on the whole island was closed early, leading to protests from the hunting organisation, the FKNK. Mifsud was not a member. To watch our film about hunting in Malta, click on the link on the screen. Poaching is causing one of the great extinctions. That's the conclusion of a new paper published in the magazine Science Advances. 
the loss of what scientists call mega herbivores such as rhinos is now running at the same rate as the Pleistocene extinction 11,000 years ago that saw everything from mammoths to woolly rhinos to saber-toothed cats wiped out. Oregon State University blames illegal hunting along with habitat loss. Would you like a stand at the game fair? A cheap way to do it might be to contact the Laird's directory. It's taking a stand at the show and featuring companies from across the world of field sports, and it has a couple of spaces still available. Contact nathan.little at lairdsporting.com. And if you just want to go to the game fair, you can take advantage of early bird prices at bit.ly forward slash 2015 game fair. Botswana's marauding elephants has triggered a debate about the hunting ban in the country. Botswana is home to a third of all African elephants. It imposed an almost complete ban on hunting wildlife in January 2014. Now villagers around the Chobe National Park who lose crops to marauding elephants say they want to replace the income generated by selling hunting rights. And finally, the Antis have launched an advertising campaign just days before the general election. With repeal of Tony Blair's ban on hunting with dogs in the Tory party sites, the campaign follows last week's news that a London casting agency was looking for untrustworthy looking models. The well-funded International Fund for Animal Welfare, which paid for the sly ones, aims to highlight a decade of illegal hunting without accusing any specific hunt. You are now to date with Phil Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Coming up in a mo, who ate my row? First, the UK is bracing itself for change, or is it going to stay the same? Let's find out what they are going to do for you. This, this England, this hunting, shooting and fishing countryside is an awfully long way most of the time from this, this Westminster bubble. But right now, during an election campaign, it suddenly becomes very important to the people who want to become MPs. Most of the time, for most MPs, this kind of countryside is something they can admire from train windows as they rattle from one city to another. But during an election campaign, the people who live here have a chance to ask before they vote for commitments, promises. Neil Parrish, a West Country farmer, took over as MP of Tiverton and Hunterton at the 2010 election from Tory grandee Angela Browning. He is working hard to appeal to the electorate in the run-up to this election, but his share of the vote is unlikely to slide. Yes, it's a pretty, a pretty pro-hunting seat. We've got about five different hunts across the, across the seat, and I've now got Axminster um, and Seaton and um, Collerton, where, um, which, which Angela didn't have. So I think it's probably even more pro-hunting than it was. Um, it's certainly, I mean, not everybody, you know, agrees with hunting naturally, but um, it's, not a, it's not really a marginal issue for me in this particular seat. One of the jobs we want the new government to carry out is to repeal Tony Blair's ban on hunting with dogs. In 2010 it all looked so possible with the election to Parliament of Simon Hart, former Countryside Alliance Chief Executive. Some feel that David Cameron has spent the last five years ignoring the issue. Neil says it's not quite as simple as that. Because David Cameron has made it a pledge that we can have a free vote on hunting, uh, Simon Hart and myself are working together on it. We would have had one in this last parliament, but the figures didn't stack up. We would have lost the vote. So therefore, you've got one shot at this, and you really have got to win it. So we may well be able to, do, uh, to go into something what's called a statutory instrument. A statutory instrument is a nice, quick, easy way of amending a law. The antis will say it's too nice and easy. It's most often used to close trunk roads for repair. But then they're the ones who had to invoke the Parliament Act to get the ban through in the first place. The other party that wants to repeal the hunting ban is UKIP. It's worth rerunning what Nigel Farage told us at last year's CLA Game Fair. You know, if Leicestershire triggers a referendum, within Leicestershire, we're getting enough signatures and has a vote, they can get fox hunting back in Leicestershire. That is the only future hunting has in Britain. We are not, in the foreseeable future, going to have a House of Commons that overturns this Act. And what we can do is get derogations on a county-by-county -county basis, and that's what I'm going to fight for. 
Well, here we are on the Somerset border, right with Devon. My seat's in Devon. We're just in Somerset here at Wellington. Um, so I take it if you know if if Devon voted yes um, and and Somerset voted no, we would hunt the fox as far as the Somerset border and then have to let it go like the Mexican bandits disappearing into Mexico in those cowboy films. But I mean, it, it, it's not a really sensible policy. Let's have a vote on on what we do in in England and and Wales and and, and settle it. And of course, if we could settle the the English votes for English laws um, and take the Scottish members of Parliament out of the equation, the vote would be quite interesting on hunting in the House. So who has been doing what? Well, the fox hunters are no slouches. There's an organisation called Vote OK that campaigns for pro-hunting candidates. They're a bit publicity shy, so they didn't want to put up anybody for interview. In 2010, they put out 12,000 canvassers in 58 of the top constituencies targeted by the Conservatives and they returned 36 pro-hunting MPs. In a tightly fought election like this one, that could make a real difference. Tim Bonner is from the Countryside Alliance. I spoke to him on Skype. Well, the, um, the Alliance is, a, is an apolitical organisation. We don't get involved in, in direct campaigning, but there's no doubt that um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a period where it's increasingly difficult for political parties to find activists, that an issue which is as, um, which motivates people like the hunting issue you know, can bring significant support to political parties uh, and, uh, and, and can make a difference. What they are very good at is delivering lots of leaflets and they're usually very fit people uh, and they get around the doorsteps very quickly um, and so therefore for delivering leaflets, especially in those seats that we want to win in the West Country, we've got lots of seats that are held by the Liberal Democrats which we really have a good shot at this time uh, and they've been very helpful. So let's have a look at some of the constituencies in this election where Vote OK has reportedly been active. Neil Parrish, you would hope, is fairly safe, but don't let that stop you from voting for him in Tiverton and Honiton. Similarly, we need Simon Hart returned in Carmarthen West and South Pembrokeshire. Mark Pritchard won the Rekin seat from Labour at the 2005 election thanks to canvassers from the Ludlow, Albrighton and South Shropshire hunts. Of the rest who have had Vote OK help, Angie Bray, candidate for Ealing Central and Action, had the support of the Heathrop hunt, who came up to London for the day. Cheryl Murray, Conservative MP for South East Cornwall, told the East Cornwall hunt supper that that their support contributed to her victory in 2010 and if she gets back in this time she will learn to ride a horse and come out hunting. David Nuttall is fighting to keep his seat in Bury North, he's had help. Rob Lockenbury, or that might be Lockenbury, wants to grab anti-hunting Labour MP Lindsay Hoyle's seat in Chorley. Cheltenham's Conservative MP hopeful Alex Chalk is happy that Vote OK is helping him but he says it's because they support the Conservatives, not him and he might not even vote for repeal. He is chasing a 10% majority by a sitting anti-hunting Lib Dem. Bath Conservative candidate Ben Howlett denied that Vote OK had been canvassing for him after it was reported in newspapers. He has to overturn the Lib Dems' massive 25% majority, but there is a new Lib Dem candidate. And most marginal of all the former MPs hoping to get their jobs back, Nicola Blackwood is fighting to keep the seat of Oxford West and Abingdon with a tiny majority. She had canvassing help from not just 107 Hunt supporters from the Heathrop Hunt, but a prominent resident of their Hunt country, David Cameron, who said he welcomed the support of Vote OK. So that's who to vote for. I'm making it sound like hunting is the only hot potato to burn your fingers on. Of course there are others but it's the one where everyone gets properly party political. I think the Labour Party, of course, likes class warfare, and, and it's not so much about the hunting issue, it's about a class issue. Now, in this part of the world, it's very much the farmers that hunt. It's very down-to-earth types of hunts. My Tiverton foxhounds, you know, I mean, they're a real down-to-earth bunch. The late Tony Banks, who famously drove the, uh, the anti-hunting campaign in Parliament, called it a totemic issue for the Labour Party. No, not for the country, not for the animal welfare, not for anything else. For the Labour Party, that's what it was about. And equally, I think there's a, there's a lot of Conservatives who, who see this as essentially an issue about civil liberties and, 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 uh, and, and, and freedom and that aren't actually that interested in the issue itself. We've put up a page on our website with links to other websites that will tell you which candidates support hunting and shooting. Basque has done some very good work here on shooting. YouTube channels like this one, Field Sports Channel, prove the popularity of hunting and shooting sports. The League Against Cruel Sports has got a channel it's watched by three old men and a cat. The Antis are on the run. Let's finish the job. Now, a few weeks ago, one of Roy's friends shot a roebuck, not 
unusual in itself, but then a very strange thing happened. In Sweden, wolves are becoming a big issue. They upset farmers, they take livestock, they anger hunters by taking game, and even, sometimes, their dogs. These are shots of a hound taken by a wolf. There's not much left. So when Roy was shown some shots of a dead roe deer which started off looking like this, then 15 minutes later looked like this, he started wondering what on earth was to blame for such damage. He shot this roebuck, went to it, obviously checked that it was dead, everything was in order, and he just pulled it up the hill a little bit, just slightly further towards the track, so he could drive his vehicle down to pick it up. And he left it there, walked up to his truck and drove back. Now, he reckons that journey um, would have taken him between 15 and 20 minutes maximum. So a very, very short amount of time elapsed between leaving the buck where it was and driving back down to it. As he drove back down to the spot where it was, the buck wasn't where he left it. When he returned to the spot, the deer had been moved 20 feet up a bank and half of it had been eaten. The, the rib cage was completely missing, so it had eaten through all of the ribs. Um, the haunch on that side uh, had been eaten through, eviscerated as well. So, you know, it had gone in there, um, taken the choice bits. There were obviously teeth marks um, on the spine where it had eaten the, uh, the ribs down. And for me, I can't quite figure out what could have done it, whether it be canine or whether it be feline. We showed these shots to some big carnivore experts. They said, Big cats start at the rump to eat, not disemboweling, and would have dragged it into cover, not open space. The neck would be marked. A lynx would probably act the same. However, wolves disembowel and might well drag into the open. If it was in Scandinavia, I might guess wolverine. As this is in the UK, then it's most likely to be badgers or a free-roaming dog. Personally, I've got my doubts because I feed a lot of uh, the carcasses to my dogs. And for my dogs to eat through a carcass like that would definitely take them more than 15 or 20 minutes. And that, you know, we've, we've got some serious doggies out there. So, yeah, it's, uh, they, they know how to eat. And that for them to do that sort of damage would, would take them a lot longer. Yeah, I think uh, it'll be quite interesting, you know, now, uh, now the sort of story's out there, um, just to see what other people think and uh, what, uh, what the viewers' opinions are as well. So I think it'll be an interesting, uh, an interesting discussion point and see what comes back from it. If anyone has any ideas, theories or photographs of wolves near the Dartford Crossing or trotting through Tunbridge Wells, please let us know. <laughs> Is there a werewolf loose? Now what gems are sparkling in the world of hunting and shooting on YouTube? It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Aussie feral control is out after foxes in a pine forest. You get a lot of post-match report in this film and no goal action, but I enjoyed it. They are enthusiasts. Meanwhile, back in the UK, it's rabbits that occupy a point of impact TV. He and mate Dave are out for the CZ 455-17HMR and Betten Solly X-Trail 12 gauge. Staying on pest control and also in the North Country, the shooting show is this week decoying pigeons in host Peter's home county of Yorkshire. Plus, Byron Pace looks at the Seiko 85 Hunter. Now to the Eastern Cape of South Africa, where Keith and Colton Warren continue their epic safari, including stalking a zebra, a springbuck, and sorting out a nuisance baboon. Next, we are in Turkey to go on a partridge shoot. It may be hard to follow unless your Turkish is up to lick, but overall, it's an interesting insight into how they do it. This is part of our public information service. You may wonder where to watch trap shooting on TV. Well, it's all on YouTube, thanks to trap shooting organising body, the ISSF. They put out hours and hours of programming of shooting World Cups including lots of disciplines. This is an interview with Antonino Barilla of Italy in English after he won the Double Trap men's final recently in Larnaca, Cyprus. Going novel now, gardening with a gun in this film does not mean sorting out Peter Rabbit, but instead broadcasting flower seeds the fun way by loading them into shot shells. And finally, the Aussie Marvel is back. Andrew Uckles proves you don't need expensive guns by doing everything he can with his bare hands. In this film, he and Laura Zera disguise themselves as black swans to go out after wild ducks. Kids, you have got to try this at home. That's it for this week. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. If nothing takes your fancy there, why not watch 24 times world champion George Digweed?
Fresh from winning his 24th world title, George talks through his season so far and how having achieved a 197 in Italy, he still missed out on the medals. In the rest of the show, George is at the Royal Berkshire Shooting School, putting a round in for the Handicap Classic. He then selects a target which may cause a few problems and guides us through it. If you shoot it just as a normal crosser, you'll always be underneath the target. Lastly, we're chatting with Game Ball's Paul James. Paul and George discuss shells, new products and the health of the shooting industry. It's all on Club Digweed. Go to georgedigweed.com to see how to join and watch the show. Well, that is it for this week. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Please go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or pop your email address into the constant contact box. And we will constantly contact you about Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. This has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs>